no one we know is particularly fond of taking out the garbage. How about the prospect of not being able to get rid of it at all? When a barge full of garbage from New York was turned away from its destination in North Carolina, it set off on a 6,000-mile odyssey. It's become something of a national joke. The story captivated the nation as the media highlighted a growing garbage crisis. The barge has quickly become a symbol of this country's growing problems with trash. The nation's crisis in disposing of solid waste. Over half the cities in the U.S. will exhaust their current landfills by 1990. A quarter century later, the entrepreneur behind the barge fiasco remains defiant. I thought it was a very good idea, and still do. The New York garbage barge raised awareness about what was done with the nation's trash. But what really kept the barge at sea so long? And what's changed since then in how we deal with waste? In 1986, a once successful Alabama builder named Lowell Harrelson was headed for bankruptcy when he heard about an opportunity 1,200 miles away. Islip Long Island's landfill was nearly full, and town officials were desperately looking for a new way to get rid of their trash. They seemed like they were willing to cooperate, and we agreed to make a test run, one trial run, to see if my grand idea was really workable. Harrelson's grand idea was simple, to ship Islip's garbage by barge to landfills in the south. But he needed help from this man, Tommy Jaswali, owner of the only private dock in New York City licensed to barge garbage. They had no one who knew anything about barging and garbage. So they come to me and they ask me, could I barge garbage from? Jaswali also lined up investors, chief among them, the mafia captain, Salvatore Avellino, who later served a decade in prison in connection with the murder of two garbage haulers. With $300,000 backing his plan, Harrelson just needed a couple of boats. I had friends in Louisiana in the maritime business, contacted them, and was able to lease me a tugboat with a big barge, the Mobro. The Mobro left port on March 22, 1987, just after Harrelson found a landfill near Moorhead City, North Carolina, that seemed willing to accept its cargo. Like a magnet for refuse, the barge by now had collected over six million pounds of trash from all over Long Island and New York City. Everybody's garbage. Everybody had a problem getting rid of their garbage. And we were the best game, I guess, at the time. At that point in time, everything looked so good take us a, a good day to get it unloaded and into the landfill. It was the start of something that I had great hopes for. Harrelson predicted profits for disposing of the Mobro's load in the first place, and eventually for generating electricity from the methane gas created as the garbage decomposed. It was an idea that I had read about. A lot of experts said it's a coming thing. So I just arbitrarily on my own decided to give it a whirl. But on April Fool's Day, shortly after the barge docked in North Carolina, a local TV news reporter was at the scene and sparked an outcry. The first call we got was, you're shipping New York City's rats down to us. And I said, no, first there was no rats on it. No one said a barge load of waste. It was a barge load of New York waste. As Jaswali remembers it, the pivotal moment came when a state environmental official spotted a bedpan on the barge. And they claimed, because of the bedpan, that the barge had hospital waste. So we were told to get it out of there. The barge then headed for a landfill in Louisiana. But when it got there, state officials again barred it from unloading. There could be infectious waste from hospitals. There could be hazardous waste. A homeless garbage barge. That's when the story exploded. Dripping brown ooze of possibly infectious material. The governor of Louisiana threatened to send out the National Guard if the barge tied up there. The vagabond barge has become an international issue. The most watched load of garbage in the memory of man. Six ports have already refused the refuse. The barge has been chased away by the warplanes of two nations, and now it's anchored here, five miles off the coast of Key West, Florida still loaded with tons of garbage, still unwanted. 
it was like a brush fire, you know. It was fun to belittle this barge full of garbage. Take your barge up into the Gulf of Persia, and there is Iran. Dump it right there. Then, in early May, a team from the EPA inspected the barge in Florida and reported finding trash from hospitals, but nothing that was truly hazardous. So the Mobro headed back to what seemed like its last best chance, New York. From here to there and back again. But when it reached New York Harbor, two court orders blocked it from unloading. Nobody in an elected position could afford to take this tainted, mythologically frightening load of who knew what into their community. As New York City's sanitation commissioner, Brendan Sexton faced public fears that seemed to be multiplying. We don't know what kind of tropical vermin is in that garbage. We don't know uh, it's been sitting in the sun for six weeks. Beyond the health worries, the media and experts often portrayed the Mobro as a symbol of a growing national problem, that landfill space was becoming scarce, and we were fast approaching a point of crisis. We've about run out of places to throw away our throwaways. By 1990, according to one federal survey, at least 27 states will be critically short of space to dump garbage. This is recess. When the county board in Sussex last month proposed opening a new garbage collection site, the residents were outraged and showed it. We are running out of places to dump. But on May 12th, a place to dump the Mobro's load appeared in, of all places, Islip, the same Long Island town that had originally rejected the trash. We'll take it because we think for a one-time situation, we should do it and get it behind us. In fact, state regulators had granted Islip the right to expand its landfill by nearly a million tons, a financial windfall for the town. But before they could take the Mobro's load, a judge ordered that it all be burned in a Brooklyn incinerator. And that's what happened, over five months after the barge left port. Harrelson has become the butt of jokes and ridicule. And today, in frustration, he gave up. The only thing I could do is get out of the way and let it go back to Brooklyn, New York, to the incinerator and die its death. Be done with it. In the end, when we unloaded the barge, it was essentially scrap paper, newspaper, cardboard. There was enough few isolated things so that I found this pink plastic yo-yo, and that wound up in the newspaper. It made clear how overblown everybody's fear had gotten. A month before the trash was burned, Greenpeace activists hung a banner. Next time, try recycling. The amount Americans recycle had climbed slowly till the mid-'80s. Then it shot up, more than tripling in the years since. Looking back, the Mobro marked a turning point. I think that the whole experience was extremely useful in getting people to say, oh, I actually have to worry about what happens to the trash after I put it out the back door, you know? I mean, somebody's gonna do something with it or fail to do something with it. But in their coverage of the Mobro, the media often failed to explain a crucial bit of backstory. In the 1970s and 80s, New regulations forced thousands of small, polluting garbage dumps to close. And that's what really set off all the panic about declining landfill space. We can start with the waste thing right away. Right. Decades later, waste experts like Alan Hershkowitz admit those fears were unfounded. We were saying, oh my god, we went from 10,000 to 5,000, from 5,000 to 2,500 landfills. They're disappearing. So it really did seem like a crisis, but it wasn't because as these smaller open dumps were appropriately closing for environmental reasons, larger regional landfills existed and were being built. But most of these big new landfills are far from cities, which means that trash has to travel. It's a trend Lowell Harrelson spotted early on, according to garbage historian Benjamin Miller. The Mobro was considered a big deal because 3,000 tons of garbage traveled 6,000 miles. In New York City today, every day, about 23,000 tons of garbage leaves the city and travels a cumulative over half a million miles to states like South Carolina, Virginia, Pennsylvania, Eastern Ohio. By Miller's estimates, New York City now sends out the equivalent of seven Mobro barges every day. 
50 Mobros every week, 2,600 Mobros a year. These are my four barges that I ship bought garbage. Tommy Jaswali eventually sold his barging station, but his company continues to haul trash by truck. Getting garbage out of New York is still the moneymaker, only because we have no landfills here. So we still got some money to be made moving garbage. The Mobro debacle nearly ruined Lowell Harrelson. And in 2001, his reputation took another hit when he was sentenced to five months in prison for evading taxes and lying to a grand jury. But in hindsight, Harrelson's plan to make electricity from garbage looks downright visionary. I think that he was actually trying to develop a model that could be replicated, a commercial model that was frankly, I think, ahead of its time. Today, Nearly 600 landfill gas projects nationwide produce almost 15 billion kilowatt hours of electricity a year. Oh, I do sometimes read about the scale of methane usage today, and my first reaction is not one of remorse. I wish I could have been in it, obviously. But it, my reaction is more like, wow, I really underestimated that opportunity. It was far greater than I had pictured it to be at the time. At age 78, Harrelson's ambition shows no signs of fading. Soon, he and his wife plan to move to Bolivia, where he hopes to mine and ship iron ore on barges like this one, 15 times larger than the one he made famous in 1987. Hopefully I won't have another Mobro experience. <laughs>